Forecasters peg today's high temperature at 86 degrees. Tomorrow, the mercury is expected to creep closer to 90. While that's pretty hot, you and I might not register much of a difference, but a shift of just a few degrees, even over the course of a century, has taken a toll on the ocean's ecosystem. WGBH News reporter Stephanie Leiden has part two of this week's Focus Report. On a stifling July day, there's a welcome breeze and some great views along Boston's Fish Pier. But just a few yards away, Sal Pantania is in another world. So did you uh, get those questions answered? Hunkered down at his desk at Ideal Seafood, Pantania has a big problem. Small fish. And everyone's looking for larger size fillets, and the fillets that we're getting now, they're very small. They're only like, you know, four to six ounce fillets as compared to before. They were 12 to 24 ounce fillets. 30 years in the wholesale business, and he says he's never seen anything like it. The last couple of years have been strange. The fish are just getting smaller. He hopes it's just part of a natural cycle. But at the New England Aquarium, researcher Michael Telusti says ocean life is reacting to climate change. For every story you hear about cod not being available, we'll actually hear stories about striped bass being up in Maine, which they've never seen before. If it was just one or two species, maybe you could talk about a cycle, but when almost everything is showing a, ch a change in range, then, then it's, it's something bigger than that. And it appears to be wreaking havoc on one of New England's most iconic and economically important ocean animals, lobster. South of Cape Cod, the lobster industry is in trouble. Rhode Island's lobster catch plummeted from more than 7 million pounds in 1990 to well under 3 million in 2012. Off Connecticut and New York, it's even worse. They've pretty much closed the fish rate in Long Island Sound because there's no resource left. While the stock appears to be in trouble south of the Cape, north of Cape Cod and here in Boston Harbor, all the way up through Gloucester and Maine, there are plenty of lobsters. It's been another banner season. Yet researchers say there are signs of trouble. This area is where bacteria actually were eating away at the shell. It's called shell disease. Researchers believe it's killing off lobsters south of the Cape. It's found in nearly a third of all lobsters off Rhode Island. Now it's beginning to show up in Maine lobsters, too. We're seeing shell disease go from being virtually non-existent in Maine to being more abundant. Telusti says the bacteria that causes shell disease grows faster when the water is warmer. Here in his aquarium lab, he cultivates thousands of lobsters for research, most of them healthy, but on this one, a freckle-like spot, the first sign of shell disease. We're trying to understand why this lobster is, be is starting to get shell disease and why a lobster living right next door to it doesn't. His hope is that finding answers in the lab will one day help lobsters in the wild. Across the harbor at Ideal Seafood, Sal Pantania welcomes the research, but wonders what's next. It could just be, you know, a natural thing that happens, or it could be something permanent. I don't know. A question as vast and complex as the ocean itself. And when it comes to rising temperatures in the ocean and the impact on sea life, researchers say something interesting. It's not just how warm it gets in the summer, but how cold it does not get in mm. the winter. And a little hard to believe, but even after that long, cold winter we've just had, remember. <laughs> you remember, it's hard to remember the day like today. Uh, at the New England Aquarium, they say that the Boston Harbor water temperature is again where it's been hmm. for the past number of years. How much anxiety was there in the air at Ideal Seafood? Because Sal Pantania seemed concerned, but not overly worried. I think he was frustrated. Right? He wants to fill those orders, and he's not sure why this is happening. He had a lot of theories, you know, maybe climate change, maybe right. it's predators. It could be a number of things. So like a lot of people, he'd like answers, um, and he'd really like some larger fish. All right. Stephanie Lydon, thank you. You're Talk welcome. to you later. So what can we do to protect New England fisheries from the effects of climate change? John Bullard is the regional administrator for the National Marine Fisheries Service. John, welcome to Greater Boston. Nice to be here. How concerned are you about what you are seeing in the ocean right now? Well, I, I'm concerned because lots of things in the ocean are changing, as, as your report showed. The temperature is changing. 2012 was the warmest sea uh, temperature in, in history, 2013 not far behind. Uh, the sea level's changing, that affects wetlands, chemistry's changing, pH, the acidification of the ocean. So lots of things are changing. Uh, I don't know what we can do about it, but it's bound to have an impact on, 
on every creature that lives in the ocean. Hold that thought about possible yeah. solutions. I want to bring in Jackie O'Dell. She's the executive director of the Northeast Seafood Coalition. Uh, Jackie, do you have a similar vantage point on this as John? Mm -hmm. Are you as concerned as he is? Um, you know, typically in the, in the ground fish industry, and that's who we um, how, who we represent is ground fish uh, businesses. What so we've that's seen: cod, cod, haddock, yes. flounders, um, redfish, um, pollock. Um, what we see is that there's a lot of variability, um, and there there are natural cycle changes. There's um, a host of different factors that come into play. Um, and, and we just, uh, we're concerned about uh, warming waters and concerned how that will impact the fisheries long term. But we also realize that there's a lot of natural cycles that occur um, and that there's also, you know, abrupt changes that could come in from, from storms, for instance, that could, that could change the dynamic of a fishery. Let me throw that back to John. Do you think what we're seeing here is a natural cycle taking place? Or do you, as Stephanie's report suggested, think that this is about um, climate change and all likelihood human created climate change? Well, it's both. Uh, as Jackie said, there are natural cycles. Uh, there are decadal cycles uh, where currents and weather systems change. El Nino in the Pacific is the most well known. But there's also climate change, and I think that's undeniably happening. And, and so uh, to bank on this just being natural cycles, I think, uh, may lead us not to take the kinds of actions that we may have to take. Uh, why are there smaller fish? He, he was filleting flounder, and, and uh, flounder are smaller, they're thinner, and they haven't produced a good year class in six, seven, eight years. Normally, you'd get good year classes where uh, small fish recruit into the fishery, and followed by bad ones. And, and there is this mm -hmm. national, natural cycle, as Jackie said, but this has been going on a long time. That produces small, thin fish. So we need to understand uh, and be prepared for the fact that some of these things are linked to trends like ocean warming that are probably not going to reverse. So you mentioned possible solutions uh, a couple minutes ago. Uh, Jackie, what do you think are solutions that people should at least be considering right now? Government regulators, fishermen? Mm -hmm. Well, I think first and foremost, how do we integrate if, if this is not a short-term trend or uh, a natural cycle and it is uh, there's scientific proof that that what we're seeing is indicative of, of long-term climate change um, then how do we factor that into our rebuilding goals our rebuilding plans our rebuilding timelines for ground fish stocks if if we're going to have less productivity occurring because of warming water temperatures then we need to factor that into our stock assessments and into our rebuilding goals and we presently don't do that. Is it, is it worth suggesting that if there's a given species that, say, right now has been deemed to be overfished, that instead of trying to protect that species when it may not be here in 20 years or 50 years, that that might change the way regulators look at you know, how we fish a particular type of fish? I think I said the word fish 20 times in that sentence, but you know what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if cod are going to be heading up to Maine and just not caught off the coast of Massachusetts mm -hmm. anymore, do we need to regulate cod fishing the way we do right now? Well, I think the answer is no. We have to change the way we regulate because species are on the move. Fishermen see that all the time because they're very uh, uh, good observers of how fish interact in the marine environment and they use temperature to catch fish. Uh, so they see fish moving. So if cod, which is a cold water species, is moving out of our region and the cod stocks are low, uh, and they, we have to understand that even though we've cut back and the fishermen are making an incredibly uh, difficult, severe economic sacrifice, uh, that even that sacrifice may not bring cod back. But warming temperatures also mean other things are in the move. So croaker, which has never been in New England, is moving in. So maybe there's a fishery to be developed. So some species leave, but other species I was going to ask, do you see commercial potential here? Um, I think that you know we're always looking for opportunities to diversify and adapt. Um, I think we're going to have to, from a from a policy perspective and a regulatory perspective, determine how we can allow uh, fishermen to enter other fisheries mm -hmm. as well. We're very um, regulated, and it's a very prescriptive in what you're allowed to participate in. But I think really the big issue for us is 
how do you, and for fishermen, is how do you modify your goals, your management goals and objectives when, you know, when productivity of fish stocks are changing? Right. So obviously, no matter how much you reduce fishing effort, if there's a climate change issue, and scientists believe that there's that issue, fishermen can't solve climate change. Okay, um, we've got to leave it there. Unfortunately, okay. very complex topic, important one. Hopefully, we can have you two back to talk more about it. Thank you both for right. being here. Appreciate it.